Good, so we'll now move to dislocation motion. The first thing that I would like to treat here is um, <clears throat> the force which a dislocation sees and which is required to move a dislocation. Uh, this force is called the Hitchcock force and is given in its general expression here, where you see this is the force per unit length of dislocation, uh, is given by this expression here. This is um, the stress tensor which has nine components in general, uh, in its general uh, formulation. And we have um, multiplication with the Burgess vector. And then that vector, which comes out from this multiplication, then has to uh, be multiplied with a cross product with a dislocation line, which we always denote here by Xi. And that gives us in general, the direction of the force. This is what the dislocation sees when it is in a stress field. An important thing uh, is that the stress field, um, that not all components of the stress tensor are relevant, but there are certain which one, uh, which really drive the dislocation or which uh, act, um, which create a force on the dislocation while others do not matter or do not matter in a direct way. Uh, and that is shown here. So uh, I made a drawing here so you can see much better um, how the orientations are. So we have Z here pointing upwards, X pointing uh, to the right, and then Y points inside of the plane. And I show you here now um, different type of distortions, which are the relevant ones. But let's go through here the multiplication. We have here the stress tensor, all the components. Uh, and we have the Burgess vector, which in this case, uh, we say it's a screw dislocation. Uh, in this case, also the Burgess vector, of course, points along the Z coordinate. And we also assume that the orientation of the dislocation line is along Z. That means when we now multiply the stress tensor with the Burgess vector, what we get is in the end here a vector where we have uh, isolated um, this, um, the relevant components here. So it basically it is the last column here because when I multiply, I have to, to turn and then the last one is selected. And then if we go and form the cross product with the formula that you have probably already seen quite a, a lot during your physics exercises and so on, uh, we will get here an expression which is uh, dependent on the Burgess vector. So the higher the Burgess vector, the higher the force. Um, this is usually a unit vector. So this one here does not really matter in the sense of the magnitude for the force because this is just unity. And then we have here the relevant um, parts of this expression. We see that the, the components of the stress tensor, which really create a force, a pitch curl force, is the YZ component here and the XZ component. And they point in different directions shown here. This is the unity vector along X and this is the unity vector along Y. That means that YZ in this coordinate here, a YZ stress drives this location along the X direction while a XZ uh, stress drives the dislocation along the Y direction. This is valid, of course, only for a screw dislocation here. And yeah, you can see here, I've shown the original uh, uh, box is here black. And then if we imagine that we distort it and create the YZ stress, then you can see that the pitch curler force would drive the dislocation in this direction. And if you have the same situation, but now applying XZ uh, stress, then we would uh, run uh, the dislocation along minus Y uh, because we have here a minus sign. So it would actually be pushed outwards of the plane. Yeah, so this shows you how the pitch curl of force is calculated in general, and it gives you a feeling how the pitch curl of force in which direction um, shear stress has to be applied in order to move a dislocation. Same thing for an edge dislocation here. 
the expression is the same, but now the Burgess vector has to be normal to the dislocation line. Dislocation line is still along Z, but now the Burgess vector here is pointing normal to the dislocation line along the X direction. Um, and we see here now, if you do the multiplication, what we isolate is this first row. We have sigma XX, sigma XY, and sigma XZ. And um, we end up with this expression here by doing the cross um, product, where we see that we have two components of the stress tensor, which are relevant again, but they are now different. Now the driving stresses are XY and also XX. What is particular now to the edge dislocation is that this component here is not a shear stress component, but it is um, a uniaxial uh, component of uh, the stress tensor. Uh, and I've shown again here a clearer representation of the stresses and how you have to deform the box in order to create the stress that we are talking about here. Let's first focus on the XY stress, where we see that we deform the, the box here, the blue box in the way shown here. Uh, that would create, um, if the Burgess vector here points in minus uh, x direction, which is the case since here the extra half plane is added in the way shown here, so that it actually points outwards, then the Burgess vector, uh, as we have discussed already, would point in minus x direction. And that would then also create a force which, uh, which drives the dislocation in minus x direction. And then we have um, the XX stress component, which corresponds to a deformation as shown here in the blue box again. It means that we are uniaxially expanding the box. And that would also create a stress, which in this case would drive the dislocation in, inside of the plane um, because the Burgess vector is negative and we have a negative sign. So in the end, the force would be positive and point in, in a positive Y direction. Yeah, so this is how it looks like for an edge dislocation. Of course, this expression can be also used for mixed dislocations. It's valid in general and can always be used to see um, how a dislocation would react to an applied shear stress locally. Of course, this can also be evaluated also on one specific point of a dislocation if it's curved. Uh, and if the stress um, itself varies, you can always calculate locally on the dislocation line. Uh, here at this point, the dislocation segment would see a force which points in that direction. What is also important now regarding dislocation motion is of course the dislocation glide plane. We've already seen uh, the glide plane before because it was also relevant uh, when we discussed the Bias Navarro model. I just want to say here a general thing about the dislocation glide plane, and that is that it is uh, spanned by the Burgess vector and the dislocation line. Uh, so it's given by the cross product of these two. Uh, vectors. Um, so it's always well defined if the Burgess vector is not parallel to the dislocation line, which is the case for all edge dislocations and for uh, mixed dislocations, but it's in general not true for screw dislocations where the Burgess vector is parallel to uh, the edge uh, to the dislocation line. And in that case, we do not span a plane and there is no well-defined glide plane according to this uh, rule here. Um, yeah, that's specific to screw dislocations. And as we will see now, that also gives screw dislocations a possibility uh, for moving, which uh, the edge dislocations do not have. There are three different types of motion that can be distinguished. Um, the most important is glide and that affects all these locations. All these locations can respond to the applied shear stress and glide. I will show you more on the next slide. But there is uh, then also uh, cross slip and climb. Cross slip is a type of motion that only screw locations can make and climb is uh, a motion that only edge and mixed dislocations can make. But I have now specific slides for all three 
uh, different points and I'm showing you more details about them. This location slide. So we have seen that already in principle, when I apply a stress, uh, I can drive at this location uh, and it has to move over the files potential uh, in the glide plane. We have seen that also with the files Navarro model that one can actually estimate the files potential, the sinusoidal variation. And I need a critical stress in order to overcome <clears throat> this periodic variation. So this is the lattice friction which I have to overcome. I just show you here once more the movie, if I'm able to start it, but I can't. Uh -huh. Why am I not able? I have to stop my presentation. It's okay, I can actually get out of this little app. Sorry. Can you still see the slides now? We can see PowerPoint. You just yeah. stopped the presentation, yes? Yes, yeah, I just want to show you the movie. That's why I, okay, here it, I can start it. I don't know why, but I cannot start it. Otherwise I will zoom a little bit in. It worked last time. Yeah, anyways. So just a reminder, uh, we had this, uh, this was, uh, this is the important thing now. This is glide, right? When the dislocation moves in this way on the glide plane and shift breaks one bond after the other one on the glide plane, this is what um, glide is all about. And if, it, well, I just repeat it, this is not glide, but this is now again glide. So one uh, break of one bond after the other uh, moves material and this motion is uh, dislocation glide. I will go back now into the presentation mode. What is important is uh, once that I said before that we need a critical stress in order to initiate glide, we have to go over the bias barrier. The bias barrier is usually very small for FCC. You don't even have to care about it because all other uh, influences are much stronger. Uh, in BCC, the bias barrier is sizable and makes effects. And I want to show you next week uh, how that really reflects in macroscopic properties. Uh, but there is always in principle a critical stress that you have to apply in order to initiate this motion that we have seen, initiate a dislocation glide. What is also important is that of all the uh, components of the stress tensor, only the XY component uh, of the shears of the stress tensor exerts really a driving force. And you always have to consider that component of the shear stress. And that um, means that you have to calculate always the resolved shear stress. Um, meaning when you, you have to go into the coordinate system of the dislocation where you have the glide plane and you have to calculate exactly what we have seen before was the x, y, and the x, z components of the stress. Then you know um, the, um, the force which is really driving the dislocation. Uh, because if you just take the stress tensor in general, there are several components which uh, do not have any direct influence. Uh, for FCC metals, it's really strictly true that we have the Schmidt law. Um, and that means that really the other components do not matter at all. For other crystal structures, they have some sort of influence, but um, it's always important to first calculate the resolved shear stress to know which stress the dislocation effectively really sees and which really drives the dislocation. There's one specific thing about uh, uh, glide planes, and that is for screw dislocations which in principle have a, not a defined glide plane, but sometimes due to the crystal, uh, one sees also a dissociation or a extension of the dislocation on one plane. And that can then also define the glide plane. Al although the cross product of Burgess vector and the, um, uh, and the dislocation line uh, orientation um, would not give the plane, due to the crystallographic effect of dissociation, you again start to define a glide plane 
And that is the case for screw dislocations in FCC crystals, where we have a dissociation on the one on one plane. And so also uh, the, uh, the screw dislocation in FCC has a defined, a defined flat plane. Okay, this was the first mechanism. Let's now focus on the second one, which is specific to screw dislocations. Um, screw dislocations may be dissociated on a glide plane, and you can see that uh, in this case, it's actually really shown for a, a screw dislocation in FCC, where we have a stacking fault, and also here the, the bounding uh, shock clip partials. And now a screw dislocation has the specific um, property that it can change the glide plane also, which is called cross slip. And this is shown here uh, in this uh, schematic. So you can imagine we are driving this location here uh, to the right uh, along the X coordinate. And then for some reason, because there is an obstacle behind, there is no way that this location can go on. And then these locations can, uh, screw these locations can change the glide plane. And that is called cross slip. So here in this case, it switches from the one on one plane to the one one minus one plane which is also a glide plane, of course, and goes on gliding on this plane. I have a movie here also for this, uh, how it looks like more on the atomic scale. Um, in this case, now I can show it for some reason, magical reason. Um, we do not look so much at this initial part where we just, okay, now start to get interesting. Okay, this is a simulation again for an FCC metal. FCC is always first. And so that's the reason why usually you see some simulations and treatments done for FCC. We have the dissociated dislocation stacking fault in between, shockly partial here, shockly partial here. And now you can see how it looks like in reality when the dislocation then cross slips. It has to contract, so it has to, the dissociation has to decrease. And now the, dis the dissociation is basically completely um, removed and the two partials have condensed back into the dislocation, into the undissociated dislocation. And now the dislocation can dissociate again, but on the different plane, as you see here, this should go on a little bit. Oh, sorry, I will show you the whole thing again without interruptions. Don't uh, regard this. Yeah, now we can see this location coming in and losing the dissociation slowly. And then dissociating again, but on a different plane. And now it can go on gliding on this plane. This was just an illustration of the cross-slip mechanism, which a screw dislocation can uh, make. Um, also in BCC, there is something similar to a cross-slip mechanism, but it is much more uh, uh, reduced on, it's on the atomic scale. Uh, here, it really depends on uh, basically the exact core structure how this location moves when you apply a pitch curl of force, which drives this location here to the right again. Uh, these are simulations that I have made. Um, we have talked about uh, screw dislocations and differential displacement maps last time. So um, <clears throat> we see the structure of this location by looking at the arrows. Here is the center. What you can see is that this is the example of a polar dislocation or a asymmetric dislocation. Um, and what happens now if you drive the dislocation will jump to the right, that happened. And now it's specific to um, this type of dislocation that, that after every step it inverts the pattern and then it does not go on gliding on this direction, but now it changes the glide plane. So before it was here on the 110 and in a similar fashion now it changes to another glide plane, which could be here the minus one, one zero, for example. And then the next step goes up here. 
And then once it arrives here, then again, it goes on gliding along the original uh, plane and then again uh, on the new plane. So it makes a zigzag motion on atomic scale, essentially. It makes a zigzag motion on 110 planes, which then looks like an effective glide on a 112 plane, or in this case, on 211. Uh, so this is something uh, specific to BCC and the screw dislocation in BCC. But usually, cross slip is um, used more in the context of um, larger obstacles or like a grain boundary or precipitate or whatever, which impedes really the dislocation to go on gliding. And then um, the dislocation has to escape. Once the, the stress grows high enough, um, it then escapes and switches the glide plane. What is important for cross slip is that you need thermal activation. It's not something which can happen uh, in this case only by applying stress, because this um, process of contraction is something which needs um, a thermal um, yeah, activation. It has to be supported in order to happen. So um, that's important because it means that if you give the system more time, the probability of cross slipping will be higher. And we will also see that the distance uh, of the dissociation is also important and uh, changes the, pro the probability for cr cross slip. And this really reflects in macroscopic strength behavior. This we have seen. And the third mechanism is then dislocation climb. Um, in this case, um, the force, the pitch curler force, shows normal to the glide plane, as is shown here. We have seen if we have a sigma xx only as the stress um, component, which is non-zero, that would correspond to press um, the rectangle in this way. And if we do that, we will see that um, the pitch curler force points out of the plane here and uh, wants to shift the dislocation normal to the glide plane. And uh, that is normal to the glide plane in general cannot be done, but it can occur with the aid of a vacancy. Because you can imagine here that we have a vacancy which is close to this location core. And then uh, you can imagine that it uh, diffuses around. make some jumps as shown here and ends up here in the front of the dislocation uh, uh, half plane which has been inserted and if a, if a vacancy now jumps exactly into this position it is effectively like removing one atoms of the half plane and that shifts then the dislocation by one step normal to the glide plane so um, vacancy or, um, or self interstitial diffusion is required for climb processes to take place. There's a convention that um, positive climb uh, is the case if atoms are removed from the half plane, like shown here, whereas negative climb arises if the atoms are added. And um, yeah, this example here is a positive climb uh, example where we require this location. Uh, vacancy to diffuse into the dislocation core. Uh, and that corresponds exactly to this situation where we compress um, uni actually. And it's not surprising then that uh, by compressing that this half plane wants to escape out, right, to make space. If we were to expand, we had the other um, situation that one uh, vacancy would actually have to be generated um, on the crack tip. So then uh, for, the, um, for the negative climb, an atom would have to jump in here and a vacancy would, have, uh, would be created and would have to diffuse out in order to um, uh, have a negative climb. But in general, uh, what is very important is that uh, climb steps um, are always connected to vacancies. Um, first of all, you, um, 
climb can only occur when vacancies can be fused, so this strongly thermally activated process. And also these locations can generate vacancies. Um, these locations when they intersect, or even here in this example, for example, if I want, if I if I were to expand, so the opposite of what's shown here, but if I were to expand the rectangle, um, that could only be uh, accomplished by emission of uh, vacancies from this, this location, which would then go into the, the bulk and would, would allow to insert a, a half plane, but of course, by creating also vacancies. Okay, so this is this location climb. These are the three mechanisms. Um, as a next point, I would like to uh, speak a little bit about defects on the dislocation line itself. So the dislocation is a line defect, and on this line we can have defects, and they are quite re um, important for motion of these locations, and that's the reason why I treat them here. So in the end, when a dislocation moves in practice, if there is a little bit of a thermal activation also there, uh, dislocations do not move in straight fashion, but will always move a little bit irregularly, creating kinks. Um, a kink is a line defect, uh, is, a, is a defect on the line where the dislocation is uh, ahead of the other portion of the dislocation as shown here. So let's imagine we want to drive or we are driving this location. Okay, in this example, it will be more logical. That this location runs here along the uh, X direction. Then we would have this, so this part of the dislocation, which is already ahead of this part. And um, that can be done by creating a kink. So a kink is nothing else than a defect on the dislocation line uh, and where the dislocation line is um, ahead of the other part. Um, a jog is different to a kink because a jog is the same thing, but when the glide plane is left by the defect. So this is shown here. We have the glide plane marked here in gray. And we have here an edge dislocation, for example, Burgess vector here. Okay, I would point uh, along the x direction. And now we have um, uh, a jog which leaves the glide plane and uh, then goes back onto the same type of glide plane but shifted by one atomic layer. And we can see that in this case, uh, also the jog itself would have a glide plane as shown here by the um, gray area. In this case, the jog is not impeding the motion of the dislocation uh, strongly because it can, the jaw can also glide. So the dislocation, if it uh, wants to move, it, uh, this part, this segment will move on this lower uh, glide plane, the upper one on this upper glide plane, and the jaw itself will uh, move on a different glide plane, which is in this image 90 degrees on the other glide plane, but could also have other angles, right? And um, and then it will also glide on this other glide plane. So this in this case, um, the jog is not strongly breaking the the dislocation. But there is a case shown here for screw dislocation. If we create a jog here, then the glide plane is now um, of the jog itself is not favorable because it would be oriented like, for example, the back plane here. And then if the dislocation here wants to move to, um, uh, to the back, uh, the, the glide plane of the um, jog is not oriented favorably. And that means that the jog has to climb and this will break the dislocation uh, or it will retard it because in the end, then we need here locally the um, vacancies to come and help the jog to move. And that will require time. And so in general, uh, screws uh, are hindered in their glide if, um, if a jog is on them. A few words also on these defects, how they can be created. Um, they can be created when two dislocations intersect. 
as shown here. For example, we imagine we have a screw dislocation here. Uh, here is the spiral, right? And now an edge dislocation comes in and cuts the screw dislocation. And what happens is that now both uh, dislocations will afterwards have a defect on their uh, dislocation line. And depending on the orientation and the character of the dislocations, uh, it will be a kink or a jog. In this case here, for example, uh, the screw intersects with an edge and it forms a jog on the edge dislocation shown here. For example, because the glide plane is here uh, horizontal, if you look here, and the jog here leaves the glide plane. Uh, this is an example where two intersecting dislocations uh, create kinks, so which um, are um, for mode in terms of motion of this location uh, another problem. So you can see here if this dislocation moves, this is an edge dislocation, and this is also an edge dislocation. Afterwards, we will have here a kink on this dislocation and a kink also on this dislocation. Uh, yeah, so all sorts of um, scenarios of intersection dislocation can be imagined, and that can create, depending on the exact character, a kink or a job. A few words uh, on what uh, hinders dislocation to move. We have seen the first part now already, that is lattice friction. So the lattice itself does not want uh, a dislocation uh, uh, letting it move. So um, one has to overcome the bias barrier. But there are uh, many other interactions which are, from a technological point of view, of strength much more relevant than lattice friction in many uh, situations. That are elastic interactions uh, between these locations. So we see work hardening in the next lecture, um, where also intersections and slogs uh, play a big role. We have interaction of uh, dislocation with solutes, which leads to solid solution strengthening or solid solutions uh, softening, for example. We have interaction with precipitates, which leads to precipitate uh, strengthening, for example. We have grain boundaries, which also hinder dislocation motion, which leads to the whole patch effect uh, on a macroscopic scale. So these are all uh, factors which can hinder this location to move and as a direct consequence also the strength of the solid is then changed. But once one overcomes lattice friction, the question now is how fast will the dislocation travel? And um, there are some uh, laws about that uh, as shown here. So this is the specific case of lithium fluoride, uh, which has here been investigated quite thoroughly. Uh, we see the applied shear stress and the velocity uh, behave um, as shown here. One has to reach the critical resolved shear stress so that the dislocation starts to glide and then it becomes uh, very fast very soon. We see that essentially in this case, if we go from 10 uh, megapascal up to I don't know, 100, we change uh, velocity over several orders of magnitude from 10 to the 9 meters per second to 10 meters per second. So it goes then very quickly. The dislocation uh, speeds up. Uh, <clears throat> what hinders here dislocation to accelerate to infinity is uh, the interaction with phonons. Um, the moving dislocation emits phonons. Um, all the time, and that leads to uh, a damping and to friction, uh, which is called phonon drag. Phonon drag is responsible why um, the curves then uh, levels off, and whether there is also a certain velocity associated to an applied shear stress. Because if you think about a simple mechanic uh, law of force equal to mass times acceleration. Uh, if I apply a force, I will get an acceleration to infinity. But in reality, in, um, in a material, uh, the dislocation does not accelerate, but it will soon uh, reach a, a steady state where um, the phonons are dragging exactly in the way 
Um, so the energy that I put in um, by applying a force is compensated exactly by the phonon drag. The upper limit for um, this location uh, velocity that can be reached is the velocity of the shear wave, but that is very hard to reach in practice, as you can see here. The, the law which um, uh, relates the velocity to the applied uh, uh, shear stress is shown here. It's a simple law. It is purely empirical based on such diagrams where you see that we have in a double logarithmic um, uh, diagram, we have a large portion which looks linear. So one can actually try to formulate um, this law where we say that uh, we have an exponent which steers how steep the slope is. N is here 25 for lithium fluoride, but N is a material dependent uh, quantity as I show here. Different materials have different N factors and also quite different velocities. One can see that the slowest are uh, tungsten and iron, which are BCC uh, metals. Um, one can see that copper, for example, has quite high dislocation velocity in comparison. Yeah, and the materials, uh, many of them show a regime where they are almost linear, uh, where the relationship between the shear stress and dislocation velocity in this double logarithmic diagram is linear. But then uh, once one goes uh, above a certain uh, value of the shear stress, then it levels off and this rule is not satisfied exactly anymore. But anyways, it's good to see that many materials have a large linear relationship. Okay, this is uh, now the last part of today's lecture where we will talk a little bit about generation of these locations. Uh, now that we know how these locations move, how they react to uh, shear stress, we can also understand how these locations are being born, right? How they are being created. Um, these locations can be generated or emitted from many defects. They cannot just um, be created in, inside of the bulk. So they always have to be created from some defect, which can be a surface, a grain boundary, a crack dip, um, for example. And um, there are some multiplication mechanisms which generate this location one after the other. And we will look now more closely into those because they are quite relevant to understand how these locations are, uh, can be stored in a material if you start deforming it, how it can happen that many dislocations accumulate in the material. The most <clears throat> important mechanism is the Frank Reed mechanism. Um, and because it's beautiful <laughs> and it's also very nice to uh, um, understand it. Um, but there are many other uh, ways that this location uh, multiplication mechanism can work. I do not go too much into details here, but I stick to the Frank Reed source uh, uh, in this lecture because I don't have time to go too much into these aspects. But um, keep in mind that there are many different uh, multiplication mechanisms operating in materials. And maybe Frank Reed uh, sources are very well understood and um, very nice to understand from the theory point of view, but may mm, not be the dominant uh, mechanism in materials. OK, one thing I would like to um, derive here a little bit. Um, so that one can understand what kind of stress do I need to apply in order to cause a loop to expand. So this is something we need to understand the Frank Reed source. And I just show you here how all your knowledge in linear elasticity <coughs> can be used to derive that. And it's quite a simple derivation. We start out with uh, the expression for the line energy that we had uh, in the second lecture which is for a mixed dislocation given by this expression here. This is just a reminder. Um, so we have the shear modulus for an isotropic material. We assume we have an isotropic material. Uh, shear modulus times a Burgess vector squared. And then we have here 
um, a factor which depends on the uh, character of this location, whether it's mixed or whether it's a screw. Uh, and depending on that, um, we will change slightly here the spree factor. And then we have uh, the logarithmic term, which we also discussed quite a bit, uh, which depends on the outer radius and the inner radius, which we consider uh, uh, and assume the inner radius often is uh, chosen to be more or less equal to the Burgess vector, and the outer radius is not exactly clear, but it's usually uh, uh, assumed to be more or less on the length scale of the problem. In this case, the length scale of the problem would be more or less the size of the loop. So this radius here, um, I just recognize it now, this radius has nothing to do with this radius shown here, but this radius is the radius uh, that if I take here at the dislocation loop, uh, I, I have to take a cylinder uh, around this loop which um, gives me my energy. If the, um, the radius, the cylinder radius is very, uh, so you have to imagine we get a torus, right? A torus shape here, like a ring, you would get a ring um, around here. And um, the size of the ring, that is this radius here. In principle, it should be infinite, but of course, if the ring itself is not infinite, then it makes sense to limit R here to a value which is more or less the radius of the loop, which is what we actually really focus on here in this derivation. So uh, just um, uh, keep in mind that all this here is just buried into alpha, which is a parameter in many derivations, not even specified and exactly, but it's usually around one, 0.51, one, because uh, we have here uh, a number which is more or less one divided four pi. And then this one is much larger than this one. It ends up to be close to one or maybe between order five and one somewhere there. But it's not really well defined around the alpha. Anyways, we assume we have a certain values and now we can calculate the um, energy increase from the line tension. If we had a dislocation loop here, right? Burgess vector is pointing here to the right, for example. So this is the dislocation line. It's closed. It's a dislocation loop, right? We will hear actually one uh, presentation about dislocation loops. So maybe I'm uh, already doing a little bit in this direction here, uh, but we will hear much more, of course, on a dislocation loops than in the specific presentation. So one can imagine that one expands the loop by a certain amount, so the radius increases. And the energy difference between the two um, loops is just simply given by this expression where we take the line energy, we multiply it by here by alpha, and then we have to uh, multiply here also by the length of the dislocation loop, which is um, in this case R1 uh, minus R2. So this is R2 pi R1 is the length of the first loop and the expanded loop has R2, and so the difference in energy is just the difference here in the radius multiplied with these factors. And then we can also imagine uh, that the thick Köhler force is applied, and uh, we put in the energy uh, by, doing, uh, by applying the shear stress here, shown here. We would uh, create a pitch Köhler force, shown here, and with these arrows, which will always point normal to the loop um, itself and it will try to expand it and we can then say that uh, the energy is nothing else than force times distance the distance is the difference between the two radii so we we apply a force which uh, shifts the um, dislocation line by r1 minus r2 and um, the force itself is given by the pitch curl force and we have to multiply again by the length of the loop so we have the um, energy increase from these two expressions. And if we equate it, what we get in the end is the stress that I need to apply to expand the loop from R1 to R2, which is what I wanted to derive here. So if I want to expand the dislocation loop with radius R1 to dislocation loop with R2, I have to apply a shear stress as indicated here, which has to be high enough uh, or has to be uh, has to have this value of alpha times GB 
divided by R1. Important is that the smaller the radius, the higher the stress. So this is similar to the um, uh, to, to do soap uh, bubbles, right? Which are which have a higher pressure inside if they're smaller. Uh, and similar here, a smaller loop has a, a needs a higher stress um, in order to expand it. Or you also know if you are uh, inflating a balloon, right? You need to have a higher pressure to create a higher pressure when the balloon is smaller than when it's larger. So this is the same. Uh, type of um, uh, rule here, but for dislocations. And now that we know the stress that we need, we can also understand the, the, the Francrete source quite well. The Francrete source is given by a segment of this location, which is uh, pinned at two points. For example, because there is a, a dislocation uh, intersection here, and here it cannot move anymore, a jog, let's say, right? Uh, on these two ends. And then I apply, apply a pitch curler force, which now drives my line in as shown here. So this is the pitch curler force locally. And then it starts to uh, create this half loop of this location. And the stress, the maximum stress that I need to apply is shown here. We have just derived expression R now is if this is the length, the distance between the two pinning points, R will be exactly half of it. So that's why here's L and here is a two. But this is in the end, the stress that I need to operate the Francrete source. Uh, once I apply this stress, the disloc uh, the, the, this, this Francrete source will operate and generate these locations one after the other. How that exactly uh, happens is then shown here. Once I go over this critical uh, stage, then uh, a kidney shaped topology is formed where these parts of the dislocation start to move in. And then uh, it expands further. Then we have here these two segments which start to annihilate here. And if they do that, what I end up with is then again my original line segment and a loop around it. And if I go on applying always this critical shear stress, what I will get is. Um, new dislocations being emitted from this pinned uh, dislocation line, one after the other. Of course, one can also, if there is a, um, an obstacle, the dislocations can create a back stress. And then that I have to add to this critical stress that uh, I have shown before. So that could also happen. Um, but if the dislocations are free to move, they will just be repelled and moved out. And then the critical stress to operate the, the Francrete source is um, uh, as shown before. I want to show you here a movie, but I cannot because my pointer is on. I think it's really related to the pointer, but I don't know how to switch it off, honestly. No, I have to get out of my of the presentation mode because otherwise to show you the movies. Oh no, and I will start it again and then I will be able to do it. Yes, now I can. Okay, so this is an image. It's not a particularly clear one, but it's uh, one that I could find and it's not easy to find them images of um, Frank Reed sources, although it's the most well-known and best studied um, uh, source of these locations, it's not easy to find a TEM images where one can see in situ how such a, a Frank Reed source operates. One can see it's not so ideal as in the, um, in the sketch because we have all of these locations, but one can see clearly this kidney-shaped topology, the, um, the, the, the dislocation segment, which forms again, and then generates the new dislocation one after the other. Yes, so this is the Frank Reed source. Uh, there are also other um, ways. This is just the remark now again. There are other um, ways this location can be generated here. We have just one pinning point that can create spirals um, moving outwards. That is also a source of this location. And here, for example, I have another movie which is 
probably even more difficult to see and even less clear how exactly these locations are being multiplied and uh, created. But uh, also in this case, we have uh, pinning points which then lead to dislocation multiplication. So it's similar to the Frank Reed mechanism, but not exactly at the same. And um, in general, such mechanisms are probably much more relevant uh, in materials than the Frank Reed mechanism. All right, so that brings me to the end. I have used exactly an hour. Do we have any questions today or was everything so clear? Uh, I cannot, I hope you're still here. <laughs> and I- Yes, yes. Hope, yeah, okay. okay. All right. Okay. But that's it from my side. Um, my last lecture will be next week. Then we will have the lecture of David and then we have the student presentations. And yeah, if you have questions, you can of course always ask me. If you have also questions on your presentation, you can also ask me or David um, if you need some support or just want to clarify something. All right, that's it. I see you next week. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. See you next week. <laughs>